Hi, welcome to another BAPT in conversation webinar. This may be my final one for a while, at least, because I'm leaving the BAPT board at the AGM coming up. And uh, we've got the uh, conference next week, um, BAPT 2023 conference. Um, Elizabeth Murphy is one of our presenters at that conference, sharing her type wisdom yeah. um, and some really interesting uh, stories, which I'll ask her about in a bit, but um, stories that help introduce type concepts to children, which sounds really fascinating. Um, Elizabeth's uh, an edu educator, psychologist, author, trainer. Um, she helps teachers, families, and teams through awareness of personality type. And she's done research around um, personality development in children, uh, including focused on, on type preferences and using video evidence to, to, to really show how young children um, really exhibit this sort of uh, behave, behavioural differences at very young ages. And she's a, a published a book um, called Developing Childs Using Jungian Type to Understand Children. Uh, she was also central to the creation of the Murphy Mice Guide to Type Indicator for Children, uh, which, although the MBTI was for adults, it, the M M MMTIC allowed children as young as seven to, to help to work, uh, work out their preferences along with the help of adults. Um, she's won awards and for her contributions to type. Uh, so welcome, Elizabeth. It's really great to have you here today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I always love talking about kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, <laughs> especially how I've got two young ones myself. So it's a really interesting topic for me too. And I understand you've, your, your love for this has also you know, helped you with your own family over the years as well. Is that right? Of course. Uh, <laughs> yes. Gordon Lawrence once said, I use type to keep my family safe and survive it because my children were totally different. My son preferred ESTP and still does. And my daughter prefers INTJ. Now they're both in their forties now. So we are long past childhood, but growing up, they saw life differently. And we, we use type awareness to be able to understand, okay, that could be a perspective too. <laughs> and how shall we go forward when we first started working with type though a lot of our energy was in helping adults believe that children could be uh, type aware Jung had made a comment once about if if children had the richness of their personality we would rob them of their childhood because part of the job of childhood is to develop but he was referencing the fully developed conscious aware personality, not the fact that we can see evidence of preferences and energies in the very, 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 very young child. I'm talking infant forward. Uh, but it's not conscious yet. It's all unconscious energy. And what I've come to really firmly believe is undeveloped preferences still have all of that energy it's just unconscious and even if you're 50 years old you're going to be influenced by that unconscious drive because you didn't develop it but if you have conscious control of it you can choose which energy you want to use for this particular task without that conscious control you are only able to react with your inner energy, because you're not listening to all your voices, you're only listening to one. That's why the image that uh, we frequently will use is for tornadoes of varying sizes in the unconscious, each representing energy, but each one is constantly in motion. So that even though you might be using your dominant, your inferior is also still spinning. So that energy is always there. It's always alive. It's just whether you can manage it or not. And what we want to teach children is to know themselves so they can manage themselves better. They can choose the way not to get out of the assignment or to be excused from anything, but to figure out the way that's going to work best for them to get it done. Well, it's fascinating. I mean, what I'd like to do is dig into some of the things you said there, like the... the um... The idea of you know, things being unconscious, um, and yet you know a lot of behavior. Would you are you saying that you know in children you know 
all or majority of what what they're doing is essentially just unconscious uh, rather than intentional choice or how would you put it? Yes. So when we would put a set of toys in front of a child, nobody taught them how to play with it. And it was a toy that they had never seen. I had the good fortune of buying a toy that soon became off the market. So they would look at it and decide what to do with it. No one had told them what to do with it. But many of our intuitive kids would take that little fish thing and look at it and go like this. And, okay, what is that done? And our sensory kids would pick it up and hold it and touch each one of the fish and look at it. And so that we literally got a, a, a numeric number that showed sensing kids paid attention to the task longer than intuitive kids. But that didn't make them smarter. It made them gathering that information. And we also learned from that that into, sensing kids like repeating an activity even after they've learned it. There's joy in doing something again that I can do. But for many intuitive kids, that's, I already did that. <laughs> Why would I do that again? So they're ready to go on to something else immediately. Um, and sometimes they will miss pieces in their eagerness to see what else there is. But those were natural reactions from the kids. It wasn't like anybody was teaching them what to do with that toy. So then that let us know that they were being driven by their unconscious preferences to say, how will you gather information about the world? And, um, and how, how old are children showing these differences that you just described? I think uh, the, the probably, I want to say six months, but it, it might have been nine months. Mm. Yeah, so pre pre walking. Um, yes, pre walking. Pre yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they're just engaging with play in a different way. Exactly. Mm. Which was so exciting and so much fun to watch. Yeah. And then to watch them when they're again, when they're uh, like the one little child that we did that with, we taped again a very similar activity. When they were mobile, they could get up. And their mother was in the room too. So they could have gotten up and gone to the mother or gone to anywhere. It was their house. How long did they stay with the toys I put in front of them? And again, it's like <laughs> my arm was getting tired from holding the camera because they just kept playing and playing and playing and playing with it. It just became behaviorally consistent across those with that sensing preference. The exploring of the information was the fun that's amazing picking those six months six month old children um you know what 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 year are we talking about that you was kind of around when you were doing those sort of um observations how many years ago would it have been there Let's see so maybe maybe 1990 Mm. something like that so so to what degree then you know in terms of like verifying you know the, the, the as they grew up and what their, their type preferences became you know did you have a chance to to follow up many of those children i i would say some of the children maybe a third but there was consistency mm -hmm. so the the type that we looked at or thought was being shown unconsciously became the type they reported as adults how did they feel about them watching back the videos of themselves as a baby doing that well um i haven't actually shown them their video when i first did it we did three sections we did a, a when the kids got older when they were verbal so like around seven years old i'd have three sections one section would be a task the second section would be a moral dilemma and the third section would be a questionnaire. Those things were going on. And the moral dilemma and the task was fun because I could give it to the seven-year-old child and to both parents. And then at the end, I would give them all a tape that showed all three of them and how they had approached it totally differently so that um, they could each appreciate that about themselves. And 
the moral dilemma was fun because you could see the judgment, the reasoning, whereas I couldn't see the judgment and reasoning for the play of the six month old. I could from the seven year old on. Yeah, so I guess, was there a different thing for all of the preferences that you saw in the older children? How, how did it come out in the seven year olds? Right, so so the one of the more dilemmas was a a version of the Heinz dilemma. And I just said, you it's your birthday and your best friend just gave you a gift you always wanted and you love it. Um, but then your friend tells you a secret and says it was stolen, it was shoplifted. What do you do? What do you say? Well, the F children were like in a crisis of conscience. It was kind of like, but I, I don't want to hurt them because, but they shouldn't have taken it. And why shouldn't they have taken it? They Because people worked hard to make those things. And, and now those people might get in trouble in their jobs. So you see all the people focus. We didn't tell them to do that. And then would you tell them your friend? No, but... But, and I love the one little girl she's, but, well, I couldn't make, they can't be my best friend anymore, but, but I won't ignore them. I'll still say hi. So it impacted the friendship. The T kids said, well, I'd say, why'd you take it? <laughs> it's like, how many of our T kids, the first thing out of their mouth was why? If I understand why in this world, I'm okay. If there's a good causal reason, I can accept it. But when there's not, then the whole thing is just stupid or unfair or something else. And when we said, would this impact your friendship? They go, mm, no, not really. I mean, it was like an event. Which for the F, it was a whole relationship mm. that was impeded by this, this one story. Um, but then I found that when I gave them to the families, that impacted my follow-up the next year when I would come back. So then I I quit doing that. But we could see consistency. So, so, well, I showed it to one mom who had a preference for Jay. And this child, I would suspect, had a preference for P. And when they were doing the sorting and organizing and the mom watched the video, the mom said, I guarantee you, if I had been sitting there, that child would not have done it that way. I said, mm. probably not, because we're smart enough to learn. Oh, mom wants me to do it this way. Mom's here, I'll do it mom's way. But what we were looking for is where is your inner energy coming? So he said, well, their natural inner energy was different than their learned way. Mm. But we can learn to adapt to our environment. What we don't want is that environment to so stifle our natural way that it never finds expression. And that's that's interesting. So when you know you've met children or even adults that have had that level of conflict of their tendencies, preferences with the environment that they've had to sort of override them. You know, what sort of issues and problems have you seen that arise from that? So one issue that I have seen too often, I think, is what I call the wounded F. Mm. The, the F in establishing relationships is, is wounded when that other person doesn't reciprocate the relationship or they make fun of you or in some way you feel unwelcome in that climate. So therefore, F is painful. So they pretend to not care, but it's only because they care so much versus our T kids. It's just an event. It's not a relationship. It's just in this one moment. It's not forever, but for F kids, if you've had a fuss with them, you have to reconfirm the relationship. You don't have to accept their behavior ever, but you have to reconfirm the relationship. So you can say, oh, I just love to death that I get to be your mom. But I hate when we have to get into these fusses over doing things wrong. So relationships solid. Yes, I want you back in my life today and tomorrow and the next day. 
but I'm angry with you. Where people who don't know you may just be angry with you. And then they just think you'll get over it. Fs don't get over it. You have to reaffirm the relationship. So we used to have one teacher who was really having a hard time in her classroom. And I said, I want you to stand at the door every morning and every night. And I want you to say, welcome to my classroom. Today, let's learn something cool. And when they go home, if it was a horrible day, you say, well, we, had, we struggled today, but come back tomorrow. I really want you to come back tomorrow. They needed to know that you're going to like me because they had gotten into a um, pattern of if you don't like me, I don't like you. And Fs do that more than Ts. So they decided the teacher didn't like them. So they were going to show that teacher a miserable life. And she was. It was, it was miserable. But it turned around because you got the relationship turned back around. So there's many, many ways. It's like I said, it's with everything we do in living and it's everything we do in learning, we use type. And when it is your way, your strength, the other language I use with the kids is it's a stretch. You have to stretch to do this one. So it's not a strength and a weakness. No, and it's not a good and a bad. It's not in a use and I don't use. It's a, I can use both. But if I'm doing this one, I'm going to have to use more energy. So in that school system in North Carolina, one of the little boys during COVID on the uh, virtual sent a message to the teacher and said, I did the assignment the way you wanted, but you should appreciate that I was in my stretch side the whole time. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. yes. And sometimes that's how it is, you know? And I'm just like, wow, great. Did you get a treat and reward yourself for having used that energy so wisely? You know, but it's energy. We're not, we're not bound to only be our preferences. We are our preferences plus our non-preferences. And it's only what kind of energy do I need to use to get that one into the real world, to bring it to consciousness? And the more I use them, the more they are available to me to bring to consciousness. So if I've used my sensing side two times and I want to pull on my sensing side, it's going to take energy to get it up here. But if I've used my sensing side 500 times when I need it, now I can just pull it up. So by adulthood, we should have a great deal of flexibility in which functions we use. If we have done our own thinking. Mm -hmm. But you can have very obedient children who have never had the opportunity to develop because they just do what they're told. And we don't want that. We want the autonomy for the kids. So it sounds like what you're saying is, you know, to enable people to be able to stretch themselves and do things that are not as preferred or as easy then you've got to give them the choice you've got to allow them to do it regularly to build up that is it are you talking a bit like a muscle as an analogy some people look at it as a muscle since i like the cycle of energy and the tornado more than i like mm -hmm. thinking of it as a muscle but yes giving them a choice but more than that not usurping and thinking for them I watched one mom and the baby was crawling. Okay, but not much more. But anyway, he couldn't reach the toy. And he was looking at that toy box and pulling and trying to get there. And the mom just went right past, picked up the toy, put it in front of him. The mom solved the problem. The child had not even cried yet or squawked, but the mom solved the problem. That's what I mean about usurping their right. He was trying to solve it. He was thinking of ways to solve it, but it got taken away because he was served. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we see our little kids struggling, we jump in too soon to help them. Or there's some myth that went around once that I don't want my children to go through the hardships I went through. So I will prevent those from being in their life. It's like, okay, but you can't prevent all of them. And what you want to do is teach them how to work with what I call the bumps. I said, we were talking before the whole group came on and I mentioned that I really think our generation uh, was taught wrong and we did wrong because we were taught 
if you do all the right things, life will be good. So if you get the right degrees, you'll get a good job. If you behave this way, you'll have a good marriage. If you do this, all will be good. And I just, I don't believe that's true. I believe every life will run into a bump. So maybe it's your dog that died, or maybe it's your, you didn't get the scholarship, or maybe it's this, no matter how hard you worked or what you did, there's going to be some down moments that are not your fault. Your house might burn down. It's not your fault, but you still have to live with the aftermath. So instead, we want to say, for all the good moments, this this can help. But if a bump comes, and bumps do, then we want to be able to be prepared to resolve it. There's a great quote that I love that it says, if you want a happy ending, you have to know where to stop the story. Well, in life, we have a lot of happy ending moments, but we also have some not happy ending moments. And we've got to live through both of them. So why would we not want to use our type tools to get through those as well? Mm. So tell me more about how you do that then, you know, give, giving people type tools to go through the bumps in life. So like if I had a teacher, let's say like a seven-year-old teacher, their first reaction is going to be, it's not fair. I don't it's fair. I, I shouldn't have gotten kicked off the team. It's not my fault the coach screwed up. And because coach screwed up now, our team is disqualified and we can't play. That's not fair. Well, if I try to get them to calm down and not say that, I am stopping their primary channel. So instead I'm gonna say, okay, let's look at through that not fairness voice. And then let's look at what we want to do with that when we're making choices. We want to look at it, how would we solve it with this? Cause we're gonna solve the problem if we're a T and what are we gonna to do to help each other out while we're doing it is our F. So who do you want to work with? How do you want to work with them is your helping way? And what can we do to solve this problem? Well, I can't change the coach. Coach is who he was, and he was the one that screwed it up. He should never have done what he did. Then we wouldn't have been kicked out of the league. But now that they're kicked out, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's not the fair. You're right. That's what you're feeling about it. But now when we want to solve the problem, we want to look at what can we do realistically and logically, and how can we do it with the people? How can we work with the people that will be involved? And it's like, well, I did hear that if you got kicked off this team, you could petition to join another team in the league. And I could try that. Like, okay. And what would be the pros and cons of that? And what would be the pros and cons of the new team you'd be working with? Well, they may not know how good I am. And if they don't know how good I am, I could be sitting on the bench the whole time. It's like, okay. So then the problem might be, how will you share your skill set with these new team members and what can you do about it? And will that be an effective solution to them not knowing? Yeah. Do you see how you're always going to pull them on both sides? Mm -hmm. I think you prepare them. Yeah, yeah. So it makes me think of that kind of dialectical approach that, um, you know, like you are kind of helping them lead with their preference, but you're, you're helping them to integrate the other side. And, and you're doing yes. it. It's, sorry you're just doing it with a lot of empathy as well i mean i'm, I'm hearing you know that you're empathizing with all the different perspectives that type would categorize um what i'm interested in is for you you know as a person of course with your own type preferences you know what challenges are there in really genuinely empath empathizing with each of those perspectives have you ever had challenges where it's kind of clashed with your own in internal sort of di direction in my life or with children with children yeah when, when you when you're really trying to empathize with with their perspective and if it clashes with your own type preferences has it caused any issues personally to try and get through that so sometimes i needed to <laughs> not be in the role of support service for you because i can't i'll give you an example my son was a maybe a junior in high school and senior in high school, maybe, but he was um, 
he was going for a, a Navy ROTC scholarship uh, for Notre Dame. Well, you have to, when you first get the scholarship, you can't have a single thing wrong with you. Not a cavity, not a bone broken, nothing, okay? You have to go in in perfect health. And he knew that, but he got into a pickup game of basketball with some local kids. And one of them stepped on his foot and fractured. Okay. That next Monday, I'm in school in one of the classes, and one of the kids sees my name tag and says, huh, I just, I just stepped on some kid with that name foot. He was always winning, and I was going to make sure he couldn't win anymore, so I just went over and stepped on his foot. Now, to me, it was like, you stepped on his foot, you, you challenged the scholarship, you did all of these things, so it's like, yeah, I said, I just had to leave the room. So I would not have been the agent to work with him in that moment because I would not have had empathy for him. Mm -hmm. I would have had anger for his judgment. Now, if I were not involved and it happened, I would have said, okay, let's look at uh, the consequences, how they went. Well, he, he had to get out of the game. We won. All right, that's one. What's another consequence? And I usually make them tell me two or three. So you're never, you're never just one. You know, it's one thing. So in other words, you can't always be the one solving the problem with the child. That's why sometimes it helps to have a second parent or a second person in the child's life who they can talk to when they can't talk to you for some reason. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, teamwork, very important. Um, I'd just like to ask a bit about development of type then through you know, through the lifespan and especially those young, early years. I, I know that, you know, there's a great article you wrote for the Journal of Analytical Psychology. Um, there's a special edition that John Beebe curated. And um, you, in your article, you write about spiral development. Uh, just I'd be interested to hear a bit about that and your thoughts about how that actually looks in a child. So in, in linear development, it looks like you get all of A and then all of B and then all of C. So you get your dominant, then you get your auxiliary, then you get your tertiary and inferior. Mm -hmm. In spiral development, it's recognizing that there's a constant, a constant motion that goes from active exploration to rest and use practice. Active exploration, rest and practice. So there's a a uh, rhythm to development, but it also recognizing that if I'm developing my sensing side, then I get one level of my sensing side developed and then the next level, and then the next level, and then the next level, and then the next level. And while these are all developing, my intuition side is down here and it's starting to do some levels, but it's not, the intuition doesn't wait to the sensing. They're all developing, but they are in a spiral so that a seven-year-old sensor is not exactly like a 70-year-old sensor. A 70-year-old sensor has learned how to use information in ways that are much faster. Like some people say, well, it takes sensors sometimes so long to process all the data, only if it's a new piece. But if you give a tax accountant all of your data and they've been doing 50,000 Tax returns, it's not a new piece. They just can go with it because they already know that system. So once a sensor knows a pattern, there's no new learning, it's fast, okay? But then the next level of sensing might be even more specificity. So I'm now not just looking at, is it orange or black? It's like, what are the nuances and, and what is the shade? I remember I had a once, I had a sensing person say to me, do you realize that you have your pages uh, upside down? And I said, I don't, I don't see that upside down. Yes, because the ink, not the ink, well, the, Im, the embossed imprint is upside down on one of the pages, the knot. I had not even noticed it had an embossed imprint for the paper. I was looking at the text printed on the paper, not 
the embossing, but that at that threw them off. It's kind of like that was a distractor for them because it was incorrect. Mm. But that was the level of specificity that her sensing was tuned into. So it's spiral because we go through active exploration and then rest and practice using it. And it's spiral because there are levels. So that one level of sensing is equal to the next is an equal to the next. And that the, all of the levels, all of the preferences are developing simultaneously. So it is not a sequential model of just mm. you do one, get it, and then you go forward. Mm. It's bringing to mind this, like you were talking about tor tornadoes before. Um, I guess there's a similar kind of thing, you know, in terms of maybe the things get sucked up the tornado, as in higher up. And, um, and I guess in terms of the energy part of that, analogy I, I, don't, I don't know enough about how tornadoes work we don't really get any in brighton where i live <laughs> but i guess do they do they sort of build up energy and speed and momentum is that how they work that i send the you know to, to is, is that kind of part of what we're saying so the the cap of the tornado gets larger and broader okay. so i think then it just is helping us see that the use of that sensing skill has a, a wider birth, a wider dimension. It's not so localized. Mm. It can be generalized more as it gets wider, uh, but not necessarily, at least I did not interpret it to mean that it's more intense. <laughs> when you're in development, you get super focused on that function. And then when you're in the rest phase and you're practicing it, you may be focused on another function instead of that one. But there, there, is a, there is a need to rest and incorporate what has already been processed into the brain so that it can be then used into the next level. Mm. So, that's true for so, adults too. Yeah. And you're talking about like, a, I guess, a, a natural development journey that it's kind of self-initiating, right? It's, you know, the, the sense that a person is just called to att attend to certain functions at certain times. Is that, is that the way you see it? It's self-initiating if the individual is in charge of initiating. Mm. But if the individual is told, just go sit down and be quiet, I'll give you your papers in a minute, and then the directions are on top, follow the directions. They could sit there, follow the directions, complete the paper, and had a, not a second of development because it was just rehearsal of learned information. So the more we focus on making children just be obedient, do what I say, the less development. But we can say, as a family, as a school, we maintain these standards. So these standards are, must be met. Now, how we meet them can be different. And you can decide your best way to meet them as long as, as it works within our family system. But if the child never is initiating, then they can't develop. But I should be in fairness. I used to always have three, three ways of making decisions. In this family, some decisions are mine and mine alone. Mm. This the family, some of these decisions are yours and yours alone. And some are negotiated. We can talk it out and see which one we want to do together. But there will be times when I, that's just what I'm going to do as a parent. And it may not match. Um, my, my son believed I should pay for grades because all of his friends were getting money for grades. I said, mm, don't believe in it. And he's like, what? What? Maybe I should just get D's and F's then. It's like, your choice, not mine but I'm not paying for grades. When you become a parent and you wanna pay for grades, you're welcome to pay for grades. But that's just a black and white standard for me. I'm not doing it. He's like, you're unreasonable. Cause his T wanted to debate it. Give me good reason why you can't pay for those. It's like, I really don't even have to have one. This is a mom time, <laughs> my choice, it's it. So I don't have to be reasonable. I can be autocratic when I want to be. That just was the one time, you know, you could do it. So I didn't get any money for grades. <laughs> so, um, that's how that's it went. Funny. That's funny. So in, in terms of like, I mean, that's that's kind of a parental 
guiding force but what about this, the school system and you know, the standardized curriculum and you know what what flexibility do children have these days to you know to, to be able to self-initiate then their own development within that system well they still have ways like for instance you have to be able on the next test to be able to a b c d okay how do you want to study for that what is your best way? For my INFJ daughter, she would want to come home, go in her room, study on her own. And when she finished a unit, call a friend and say, oh, I just finished that part. Woo. My son had four friends over and they danced to physics terms. So they were dancing, they were laughing, they were playing around, but they were throwing out physics terms. But the research is clear that when you remember a motor movement, it recalls the same thing. So he couldn't dance taking the test, but he could close his eyes and remember dancing and recall the physics terms. Mm. If I made my daughter study like that, she would have failed. If I put my son in his room and said, just study, he would have failed. So they had the um, ability to figure out their own path for meeting a common objective, which is you need to know this information. So the schools have a common objective of information. They want you to be able to have a mastery of this content, but where they need to be is more flexible in the processing of it. So in that North Carolina school, we gave the kids a sheet of paper divided just S, N, T, and F. And they were doing Peter Pan. And should Peter Pan and Captain Hook become friends or some question like that? So they were to fill in each of the boxes and say, what do you know in terms of sensing information? What ideas are possible? What's a consequence of their friendship or lack of friendship? And how would that friendship work out? So we had a little girl. So this was a young class. I think they were, they might've been third grade or could have been even second. But anyway, her sensing box was filled with more written on the back, but nothing was written in any of the other three boxes. Why? All her energy naturally was in that sensing box. So he said, okay, hon, you've got five more minutes. And as much as you want to stay here, in five minutes, you need to have at least one entry in each of these other three boxes. So stretch and push yourself forward to get some energy here into each of these boxes. So she did. When they were giving the report back, of course, she wanted to report back the sensing which was brilliant, but not that. But one of her friends was interesting because her answer in the feeling box was pretty shallow. And her friend said, that's because that was a stretch for her and she didn't have enough energy left in, when she was stretching to really give some thought to it. But I bet if we had given her more time, that would have been a better answer for her there. So teaching about the differences, getting them to feel the stretch, gave them some natural empathy for each other expressing that stretch. Mm. And that's the kind of innuendo that happens when type exists in the learning environment, you know, the living environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so using good, what dynamic language, you know, and showing that um, people can, can stretch, but then knowing that there's, a, there's a, an energy cost to that. Um, yes. I know that like uh, when one class I observed, it was a different school system. The little girl was still working on the math and some of the friends were done. And she looked at them, she goes, this is my stretch subject. So it's taking me a little longer. They were like, cool. Without type, she would have said, I'm just not as smart as them. Everything would have been attributed to dumb or smart when it had nothing to do with dumb or smart. It had to do with pacing. So yes, I do believe that keeping type alive in the environment gives you options for the individual to develop, but also for a sense of community and family to develop where you respect each other's style difference without accepting any inappropriate behavior or any inappropriate idea. So it's... It, it's kind of like saying, I see where you are, but let's let's uh, start where you are and then let's step one more way. 
And we just look at it through all four lenses every time. Mm. What's the sensing side? What's the intuitive side? What's the thinking side? What's the feeling side? Mm. Tell me more about the, when you use the word inappropriate, you know, um, you know what, what does that look like? Are, are we talking this sort of types, not an excuse for destructive behavior or something else? Yeah. Well, no, like uh, one year, the two friends, they were laughing and they were like, well, we're going to go toilet paper these friends' houses. It's like, hmm. Mm. Might sound like a fun thing to do, but I'm going to tell you that that's not an acceptable thing to do. So what other fun things are possible? Versus you will not. You know what a mess that is for the parent or person who has that in their yard and has that in their house? Um. So it's like the naivete of, oh, this would be cool and fun without thinking of any of the other perspectives would be like, well, let's just, let's just look at it and say, so you got the toilet paper and did you, you have it? Where's your money? How are you getting it? Blah, blah. And then are there any other ideas or ways to have fun? And why are you choosing this one? And then uh, what would be the natural consequences of this? The, especially if it rains tonight though, that's a mess when it rains right after. And how do you think that people will feel? Although it's cool. If you get picked to be toilet paper, it's a, it's a cool honor. It's like, mm, you sure? Not everybody feels that way. Um, I had a neighbor once, so we're talking adults. And the, the team wanted to tease their supervisor, and he was a supervisor. And so they TP'd his house. He was not a happy camper. He was not. He did not find that humorous at all. Now they were laughing they thought it was hysterical. He never did. So their hope was to have a, a practical joke kind of informal relationship with their supervisor. That isn't what they got. So again, we keep with exploring it. But if it violated my value and you were my child, I would say, mm, it's not an option. Pick another one. <laughs> Yeah. That's, that's mom's choice <laughs> yeah that's not negotiable yeah not good. yeah um just uh, another question for you then is um you know out of your experience um from the 16 types you know what who have you seen in in general you know which types struggle more in this sort of uh, school environment um as it typically is no it would be more like in what way does the different type? Everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think our in <laughs> I think NTs are incredibly challenged in kindergarten. So many of them have come in already knowing their letters, reading, and the teacher's going to teach them. They have to write the letters, and they have to copy the spelling words. Well, they do not see any good reason for doing any of that. They already know them. Why should they? But they have to because, and there aren't usually that many. So they then become then like challenging. Why do I have to do this? And the teachers don't always at that grade level appreciate being challenged because they're thinking F, F is very persuasive, cooperate, let's work together, thoughts. So they see that kind of, challenge as uh, inappropriate behavior when it's very appropriate for the person to challenge why am I doing that kind of work but we solve that easily by just saying all you have to do is do it for me once and if you can show me that you can write each one of the letters then when we do letter practicing because some kids here would like to have that opportunity then you may do an in lieu of paper so I will give you another pile of papers over here and you can pick one of those you want to work on. So it might be label all the parts of a frog. It might be read this little booklet and be prepared to tell the class three things you learned from reading it. So I can give other assignments and you can have your choice of whether you want to do those advanced assignments or you want to do the practice of the writing again. Um, but it's when they never have a choice that that type struggles. F kids struggle all the time when they feel um, not welcome. It's like 
they used to say, you know, kids don't learn from teachers. They don't like for F kids. It's kids don't learn from teachers. They think don't like them. And if they think the teacher does not like them, it is so hard for them to get into the content. But that's across all of the grades from kindergarten up forward. So I think there's challenges in the system and it's usually around relationships and content. You know? mm. no, it's a nice way to look at it. Yeah. All different types and struggle in different ways. Um, and at different Everybody levels. gets some bumps. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Everybody gets some bumps. Yeah. And then what do you do? Solve the bump <laughs> or cope with the bump. Because in resiliency, we can either change the setting by solving the problem, or we have to um, change ourselves by not caring, or we have to cope. But that's part of what deals with the resiliency of when I can't be in charge of what they're making me do. I have to do it. Mm. Um, I have to have those other options. Mm. I'm interested in like you know the impact of how this work has managed how far it's managed to integrate into the sort of school system at, at large I know there's yourself doing this work Jane Kesey who I've, you probably know who I've done interviews with before on here as well and there'd be other you know, how, how many people do you think there are like yourselves who are who are really trying to integrate this into the school system um, and how much impact has, has, it, has it made over the years how, how well has it been taken in The good news is it seems that those who have felt that this is a tool for helping honor differences continue using it regardless. But the struggle is it's not funded. So the training isn't funded for the kids or for the teachers. So you have to almost do it incidentally. But I would do that as a teacher. I would just go in every day and I would just say, do you know there's one um, difference that we haven't learned about people? Is that some people like multiple examples to confirm their understanding, not to, that they didn't get it. And some only like one or two. And in the world, there's actually more people who like the many. So sometimes I will give many examples. And when I do, those who only wanted one or two, just know that I'm doing that for your friends in the classroom. And sometimes I may only give one of two examples and know that if you needed more, you can see me after class and I'll give you as many more as you want. So I've taken, what well, that wasn't even 30 seconds, but I've already discussed an SN difference and I've told them two strategies for dealing with. It. You do that once a day for every day in the classroom, you got 183, 185 pieces of information shared quickly. Mm. And that's just one thing. I could have done it 15 times in it, you know. Yeah. So I wish it would be more, but I also believe that if it's not used, it doesn't matter. I just know that when the kids have heard it and learn it, I don't care if they use the young terms, but when they understand your way of thinking is not like my way of thinking, but we both have to get to here, then we create a different climate of tolerance and acceptance without one that says I have to tolerate inappropriate behaviors. Mm. It's just, so you can't yell at me and, and be mean to me just because you don't like what I said. So I just say, you can disagree with me in a friendly, polite way. Mm. And you can share your thoughts, but you may not be mean to me. And I can do that by type. And they go, how does that mean to you? I just said you were stupid. I thought that was a mean thing, a way of saying it. If you were going to tell me I didn't get it, you could say, you don't ever seem to understand what I'm trying to say. And then our problem is, how do we talk to each other so I can understand what you're trying to say? But we need to give kids a reason why it's okay to not think like the other person. Um, so I would love to see it be more than it is, but I'm also, I'm not also not one that says we have to rush it. It's, it's like I, do, I want it there and I would love to see it funded, but we haven't even acknowledged the unconscious when we teach the body and the, and the mechanisms of the body. We don't even talk about the unconscious as it exists. So if you ask kids, what's the unconscious, they think it's that medical state of not being aware of anything. You're unconscious 
It's like, oh, yeah, okay, well, no, there's more. But they really don't get taught that. So we're behind the times. You know, when all of that was written, it was probably more behavioristic. And so they didn't accept that there was an unconscious. Um, so it didn't get into the school curriculum. But when you talk to the kids about energy, they totally get it. They really do. It's like, it's not about this is your type. This is your type. It's like, you got both inside of you. One is an easy access energy and one is a stretch. You're going to have to work a little harder to pull that energy up. But the more you practice it, the easier it'll become. They get that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's wonderful hearing, you know, the words, the language you use, you know, really around diversity and equality, things that really are on the agenda these days. And, you know, that I think it's psychological diversity isn't as quite understood as, as other forms in some time, sometimes. So, um, and, and I, I think it's curious that, but it also is a learning diversity that that's why it's living and learning. We, we want to type in there to help them with the living differences, but we want them to also appreciate the learning differences. Um, this one happens. To, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Richard. No, no, it's all right. I've, I've lost thought now, but um, it's all right. Um, I think we're nearly coming up to coming to a close, but I, I mean, just to finish off, would be, you know, just good to hear you reflect on, you know, any stories about, you know, some of the some of the personal impacts you, you've had on, you know, people's lives um, as you've seen them grow up. You know, what you know, what what's the impact of having this kind of counselling mm -hmm. from this the way you're describing it? You know, what what's that? Um, how has that impacted on people's lives and people you've known oh i think it would be the same story that many would have that that you would uh, when you believe it and it works so my daughter of course grew up knowing type mm -hmm. and uh, when she be was a freshman in college she calls me and she says mom i want to give the mbti to my friends here and i said well hon the problem is you're not eligible to give the mbti why I understand it I said yes but you need to be certified and you're not certified by degree or by certification program and she goes but I get it I could tell them all about type it's like well you can have all the discussions you want about type but if you want to give them the opportunity to take the MBTI you either need to get certified or you need to find somebody in your world who can do that for you so she chose to get certified when she was still in college to Mm. to be able to have access to that now nobody told her to do that it was just something real in her life you know and um my istj husband never really quote got into type like i did but he kept looking at type their oral pages a little booklet of looking at type and he just said you know one of the co-workers came over and was doing something i said Let's, let me just show you one difference between people. And he'd pull out and just show him one or two pages. And he said, hey, it just he gives it helps. It helps. <laughs> it's like, okay. So it's, uh, it's people who realize this about themselves. I think their ego has more tools to get through life. And when the ego has more tools to get through life, we find people who have a better... Uh, resiliency and self um, awareness that is going to make it possible for them to deal with a lot of differences. When we look at all of the pain that's happening in our world, so much of it seems to me um, because there's not a sense of belonging. And so that sense of belonging can be engendered in a mixed environment. It doesn't have to be a everybody's the same environment and type is the best tool for that in my mind. So. it's wonderful it's a great great philosophy and it is there's so much in line with like uh, well briggs myers as well from what i've known of, of her thought and thinking as well so um you know really bringing that um the equality and and yeah equity to to type and, mm -hmm. and how we are so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today it's been really good to speak with you um been looking forward to this for a long time and it's been great so Thank you. We've talked again. I'm looking forward to your uh, presentation at the BAPT conference, hearing some of the stories you've got, 
to tell, tell her, which will help to introduce type to children and characters yeah. in stories. So yeah, thank you for that. And um, take care. We'll see, see you again. Oh, okay, then. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. My pleasure. If you have questions, you can let me know. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>